Hello and welcome to Who Noob and Who Veteran. I'm the Who Veteran, my name is Eugene. I'm a veteran to both new and classic Doctor Who. And I'm the Who Noob and I've only seen the Peter Cavaldi series. From last series. Yeah. And this series now. And this series. Which is getting exciting, I feel. Yeah. Anyway, today we are reviewing Under the Lake and Before the Flood. So, uh, yeah, take it away, Russell. What did you What did you think? I really liked it. Um, I I I thought. Well, I know that we're sort of reviewing these as one story. Yeah. But I do have to say, the second episode got more, grabbed me more. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I think the first episode did a good job of setting out, especially the end. When we, you know, we thought that, yeah, he was dead. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I really liked it. I really liked it. What did you think? I really liked it too. Yeah, I really liked it. Uh, unlike you, I found both parts very engaging. Uh, I've got a ton, and I mean a ton of notes on this episode. Well, do you, so should you start, and then we can see if you might cover some of my think. notes. You know, and then okay, reverse it this time. We'll reverse it. Reverse the polarity. That joke's lost on you. <laughs> you lost me. Uh, okay, my first note. Oil guy is dumb. The guy in... The first guy, actually no, he's the second guy to die, but you know, he was the guy who was there because, you know, they, he had the the oil rights, because they're there mining for oil, and you know, he was just, he, uh, was, he was an unlikable jerk, he was just there so that he could... Was he the one that got burnt? No, he, he's the one that got, um, drowned. Oh, the one that got drowned, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was like, an egg, eh? And it was just like, the only reason he was there was so that he could die and he wouldn't feel bad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't like him either. It was kind of like, yeah, kill him. Yeah, and yeah. uh, you didn't like not liking him either. Yeah. We, Oh, yeah, yeah, he wasn't a guy that you enjoy. Like, yeah. It's not like Darth Vader. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hang on, wrong movie. franchise. Yeah, well, I was going to say Cersei from Game of Thrones. That's a comp that's way... Don't worry, save up your Game of Thrones references for next week. Next week. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't like him either. Yeah. But, uh, but still, he was, he was out of it very quickly at the start, mm -hmm. so... Mm -hmm. did annoy me, but... Um, there was no depth to his character, he was mm. just there to die. Mm. But anyway, moving on, it was, it was just a small part of it. Overall, the guest cast, though, in this two-parter was great. You know, I've, I've got really attached to everyone, everyone felt like well-fleshed-out characters. Especially Cass, the deaf girl. Mm. The, the, the thing yeah. I really liked about her was that her being deaf wasn't her only character trait. Yeah. Because a lot of the time with characters like that, it's like, oh, you're She's deaf, deaf yeah. and yeah. that's that's the only character they get. It's like, oh, they're gay, and yeah. that's the only character they get. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That wasn't it. She was deaf, but she was, she was also a strong, good and leader. And she was a leader, yeah. And she was in love with, um, uh, um, What's run, run, run. But did you, did you, did you notice that they were in love before the end, before the end? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, well, I'm not necessarily in love, but definitely a very strong connection. Yeah, there. strong connection, and yeah. And it, you know, it made sense at the end when it was like, you know, they're in love. I was like, yep, yep, I am. Mm. Um, yep, I, can, I saw that coming. Mm. Mm. I mean, as in, like, on a repeat viewing, I can see that coming. Yeah. The first time through, it's like, oh, they're just good friends. Yeah. And the second time through, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I saw the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, although. Well, first time watching it, I thought the romance sort of between O'Donnell and, um, again, his name's dropped out of my head, the, the other one, the sciencey one, the scientist. Oh, uh, yeah. The, ro yeah. The, the romance between them, I thought, kind of just came out of nowhere, and it just felt like... Also, yeah, I thought like it was a way to make her death feel more dramatic. Yeah. But then, again, I was only on first time viewing, I had that. When I went back and viewed it a second time... You saw it. I, I saw a few bits in part one where they did kind of have, like, just... It was Another very moment. subtle. But there were very subtle little kind of like click moments, like when she punched him on the arm, mm. when O'Donnell punched him on the arm, it's and stuff. Like, it's like, oh, okay, I see, I see there's a connection between them. Yeah, um, yeah well I only saw it the one, so it would be interesting to go back and, and 
into This you. episode had rewatchability. Yeah. There was lots, lots of little things which you wouldn't pick up on the first time through. Even storyline sort of stuff as well, you know, not just the subtleness of the, you know, I feel like there's a, the storyline itself had enough depth to, if you rewatched it, to go, oh, that's why. Because the time know. travel. Yeah, yeah, especially, yeah. well, that's, yeah, that's, that's something that's cool about time travel. Is that it can take a few times. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, but yeah, and O'Donnell, she's like Osgood, only better, in my opinion. She's what good? She's like Osgood, but better. Oh, okay. You remember Osgood from the last series? Which one was Osgood? I'm trying to remember. Osgood, um, she was the real geeky doctor fan, and then she got killed by Missy. Oh, yes, 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 yes. The big yes. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I, you know, she was kind of like her as in, again, she was a big admirer of, like, the Doctor. Mm. She worked for you in it, and she's read all his files and yeah. stuff. But, no, Osgood, again, she's like one of those characters where, oh, she's a fan of the Doctor. That's her only personality trait. Yeah, yeah. Whereas O'Donnell, it's like, again, she's a good, strong, mm. you know, uh, Got a lot going. Uh, intelligent person. Who also has a softer, kind of geekier side to her at yeah. times, but still, nevertheless, she feels like someone who belongs in the military, though. Yeah. No, she had that cute moment with that guy when um, she was like, carry on to the doctor, and she turned around and she's like, it's bigger than the inside. Yeah, it's bigger than the inside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's like, we would all do that if we actually met the doctor. Yeah. yeah. It's like, we'd be like, okay, God, be serious, it's dangerous. That's bigger than the inside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, great guest cast. I felt very attached to everyone, and I did feel genuinely sad when O'Donnell died. Mm. And the good thing is that she died and stayed dead. Mm. There was no, like, cheap bringing her back to life yeah. stuff. Yeah. It's like... And later on in the episode, the Doctor gives a speech about how you can't just go back and save the people who have died, mm. or something like that, you know. You have to face death. Mm. And it's mm. like, my God! We're getting a story about the consequences of death and how it actually is permanent and you have to face it, even with time travel, in the Stephen Moffat era. Mm -hmm. Like, I thought, I thought that was gone since Russell T Davies left. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's what Russell T Davies was about. It was mm -hmm. all about death is permanent and you can't undo it even with time travel, yeah. most of the time. Yeah. But like, but then when Stephen Moffat came in, he was like, time travel everything, retcon yeah, everything, yeah. make everything happy and fairy tale. Yeah. But now it's like, no, it's the Capaldi era now. We're going darker again. We're being... We're having actual consequences again and yeah. real drama again. Mm -hmm. Death is permanent. Um, Should be. Yeah. And just one more thing and then I'll let you speak for a bit. Mm, that's all right. Uh, but, um... You keep going through. Well, another, another thing is that this episode fixed death in heaven. It what? It fixed death in heaven. How do that? Because the when the doctor first sort of figures out that there are that there are ghosts. Yeah. Um and he's going in you know, they're 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 not flesh avatars, they're not holograms, they're odd digital copies bouncing around the nether sphere. Yeah. <coughs> and it's like, yes, you fixed death in heaven because now because of that little throwaway line of dialogue, that now means that it wasn't actually their minds and souls going to the net net the sphere when they died in dark water death and heaven now yeah. it was copies of them oh right so, yeah 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 so when you die you don't actually go there what happens is that you go to probably what the uh, de life after death was like in tortured which is perhaps even worse but mm. it's a whole other video um, but still you know you go where you, you wherever you go after death but then your mind and soul gets copied though, and then sent over to the net net is found. After this episode we now know those are like copies of them. So their actual yeah. bodies would get turned to Cybermen. But then when their souls and minds are returned to the bodies though, those are copies of the original though. Yeah. So yeah. yes, the Brigadier did become a Cyberman, but only his body became a Cyberman. And the the mind inside that Cyberman, the mind and soul was just a copy of the Brigadier. So the Brigadier is actually still happy, happily, peacefully passed away in his bed yeah. like he should have done in the Wedding of River Song. Thank you this episode. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, and also this episode is quite violent at points. It got people being incinerated being mm. drowned mm -hmm. and there was, this, yeah, there was this scene where like the ghost was going to 
hit the guy over the head of a spanner. But then and the accents, because that made, like, do you know what I mean? Even though you didn't see anyone actually get axed, you sort of you start picturing what's going to happen in your head. Yeah. Use it to your imagination, which was and the accent awesome. that was cool too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was one of the things I wrote down. Where um, the deaf, oh, I shouldn't call her the deaf. Both oh, this year, she's a deaf girl. Um, is Cass. Wa- Cass is walking along, and and the ghost is following her with the axe, and you can hear when it's on the ghost and the axe, you can hear it, and then it cuts to her eh, and mm-hmm. it's it shows what she can hear. It's dead silent. It was that was crazy. And then, and then and then she kneels down. She kneels down. And she can feel it. And, and then it goes in that weird like that weird video. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that was cool. Doctor Who temporarily became Daredevil. And it was different, you know. I mean, like, like death rather than blind. Yeah, it, but well, still Daredevil-ish. Yeah, and it was it was different too. Like it was like it was clever filmmaking as opposed to just you know just having him walk up behind her and then she luckily and dodges she, yeah, him she like time. Dodges, you know? This episode just overall felt quite fresh. There were some like moments and ideas which mm. were a bit similar to other episodes, but that's more just, you know, the show's been running for 52 years, occasionally mm. going to get some stuff that feels a bit familiar. Mm. Like the writing on the wall not translating, that was a bit like Satan Pit, but mm. the explanation was very different to Satan Pit though. Mm. Yeah, and Saint and Pitt was just like, this writing is so old that TARDIS can't translate it because it's impossibly old. Here, that was because it wasn't actually writing. There were magnets. That's why the TARDIS wasn't translating yeah. it. It wasn't actually writing. Yeah. Um, and I, I also liked it how only the people who had seen the writing were being targeted by being the killed. ghosts. Mm. So, um, the guy whose name sounds a bit like Run and was in love with Cass, you know, he didn't get killed mm. because he hadn't seen the writing. But then Cass still wants to go out and save him, because she's well, like... Well, I mean, he is still in danger, because yeah. you know, they did end up using him as bait to get them. Yeah, true. You know, they were still... They were, those ghosts were clever, they were still using yeah. him. Um, and, and the ghost doctor turning into a hologram... The, initially, that felt kind of disappointing to me when I first watched mm. it, but... On second viewing, one, the hologram thing is well set up, because... You know, first the doctor uses the hologram car to trap the ghosts, yeah. and then it's like, okay, and the hologram thing comes back into it. It's like, nice setup and payoff there. Mm. So it doesn't just come out of nowhere. And it also worked well with that, um, the idea of the bootstrap. The bootstrap paradox. paradox because that was the whole idea that, uh, and I kind of like that, even though people might look at that whole idea as, oh, it's sort of a cheap way of, of being able to keep loops in your... That's your, not a plot hole, because it is explained. Yeah, that's what I mean, but do, do you know what I mean? Like, if if that hadn't been there, mm. if that idea hadn't been brought up, we would, probably would have watched the episode and gone, hold on, how about these loopholes? Do you know what I mean? How did he How did he work that out, you know? How did he come up with that idea? But the, I, the whole fact that that was put in there, exactly, it takes away the... The plot hole. The, the plot holes that mm-hmm. you might think were there beforehand, and it actually makes the whole the whole episode more in depth because it get, it, it gets your you thinking about this idea, you know. Mm, the time. It raises questions in your own head about time travel. About time travel. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the slightly odd thing is that you know we've had heaps of episodes kind of like this, but only now we're getting sort of like the bootstrap paradox kind of being brought up. Mm. I'm sure it's been brought up once before, possibly, but, you know, this is like, they really talk about the bootstrap paradox mm. a lot in this episode, and they have that whole fourth wall-breaking segment, which... It's a cool idea to bring up, you know? It's like, you know, it, it, it makes you think. And, and, and I think that because he had... Um, I, I think that's made the idea of the him using the... What, what was it he used? To make his ghost, the sonic sunglasses. No, but it it was a hologram. The, the, hologram. the hologram. It made the hologram sort of work even more, you know. Yeah, because he got the idea. He got the idea. Yeah. The fact that he was like, you know. Yeah. I have a ghost there, but I can escape death. Oh, I can make a hologram because I just made a hologram before. Yeah. And then okay, okay, yeah, I see it. I see yeah. it. I see how this is all piecing together. Mm. And then also that made sense how the doctor could go back in time before the events when he arrived because. 
Yeah, I remember watching part one and thinking, how can the Doctor go back in time to before he arrived because he's a part of events now, he shouldn't be able to go back. That contradicts previously established rules in Doctor mm. Who. But then, later on in the episode, you know, the Doctor then tries to go forward in time back to Kara after they've gone there, but he couldn't go, the TARDIS wouldn't let him, mm. because you can't, you can't, once you're part of events, you can't time travel. And so it's like, so why could he go back before? Ah, oh, because he, had, he was supposed to go back, because this whole situation had turned out the way it was, because he did go back. Yeah. So that's why he could go back, because part of events had already dictated that he did go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, it's that cool, like, that time travel thing, you know? Yeah. It's like, oh, he could break the rules of time because the rules of time said that he had to break the rules of time in order to follow the rules of time. Okay, my head's hurting now. Yeah, yeah. And that's the sort of stuff I think if they hadn't brought up the, the you know, the bootstrap paradox, we would have been sitting there going, how does this work? Do you know what I mean? Maybe. I mean, I, I'm not... You mean... They, like, the script could have still played out the same way, but they just... If get rid of the mention of bootstrap paradox. Yeah, so. yeah. It wouldn't have been a plot hole to me, because I've just gone, oh, he got the idea from seeing it happen in the future. But then again, I've watched a ton of Doctor Who, and my mind mm. is used to thinking in this kind of time travel way. Yeah, yeah. Whereas a newcomer like you... Yeah, maybe. well, yeah. I probably <clears> would have watched it and go on. My other note, great music in it. Mm. Uh, the, the, the rock intro to part two. Yeah. That's great, and um, I really like that. Um, and I also really like the, the 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 really tense music that was playing in a few of the scenes, mm. particularly the scene when they're trying to trap the ghosts. Oh yeah. And there was that really tense kind of thumping music going on. Then I was like, Murray Gold, good word. Whenever I think it's like it's been a decade you've been writing the music for the show now, maybe you should move on, get some fresh blood for the music. Then you do an episode like this. I'm like, nope, you can stay. So is he, does he do all of the episodes? Yeah, he does all of the music for all of the episodes for the last oh. 10 years. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So it's like, yeah, sometimes I'm like, there'll be an episode, I'll be like, oh, the music kind of just felt a bit like some of the old tracks just kind of remixed. I, yeah. I think he's running out of ideas and needs to, mm -hmm. I think we might need a new composer now. And then we get an episode like this one, and I'm like, stay, stay, yeah. please. Yeah. You're awesome. You're a musical genius. Um... There's also a few ref this, this episode's written by Toby Woodhouse, and um, Toby kind of references a few of his other stories in it. Mm. There's uh, one of the little cue cards the Twelfth Doctor has, mm. um, which I love those little cue cards. That was a great scene. Um, one of those little cue cards sort of mentions Sarah Jane Smith, who was, used to be a companion of the Doctor way back in the 70s, but she came back in an episode written by Toby Woodhouse in yeah. the new series. Um, and then also the Cow the Alien, which I can never remember their names, but the, they look a bit mole like. The guy with the top hat. Oh, that alien. Uh, Prentice. And what? And, and what? The story. Oh, yeah, yeah. Prentice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the one with the top hat. Yeah. The, the mole like guy. Yeah. Um, the, he was the funeral. The, yeah, the Undertaker. Yeah, undertaker. Um, anyway, he was. You know, this is the second time we've seen a species, and guess what? The first time we saw the species? Another Toby Woodhouse story. Oh, was that? Yeah, <laughs> so it's yeah, like yeah, Toby yeah. Woodhouse is kind of referencing himself a bit here. Um, uh, but yeah, I kind of remember me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I took a year off last year yeah. and the year before, so come on, let's celebrate and back. Yeah, yeah. It's my first ever two parter. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, okay, now one more, one more thing I want to talk about, and then I'll talk about the thing I really, really want to talk about. So two more things I want to talk about. One, the Fisher King, he was cool. He was awesome. He, was he looked really, really, it was well done. Like, like yeah, he looked, he looked, even, <laughs> he looked believable. Yeah. Like, even though he's an alien. Yeah. But he was tall. Man. Yeah. He was, yeah. Uh, uh, roughly eight foot. And I liked how they didn't, um... It took a while for them to completely reveal him. Yeah. You know? Like, there was a part where he walked past, past the window. window. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, the, the guy who played him was, was, I believe, the tallest man in England. And he's over seven foot. The guy who played him. And then once you put all the, the, the so costume on him, he's eight foot. Wow. And then Capelli's six foot. Yeah, and yeah. He's got this big, tall, eight foot thing looking over him. It's like, Capelli's a tall man. So to see him so kind of physically intimidated like that, it's like, like, 
you know, we know that the doctor had a plan already by the time he went there because he'd mm. gone and set up the little charge by the dam to make yeah. it blow up and all that stuff. It was like he had planned it all out by that stage. Mm. But still, he felt scared though because he was kind of afraid that before he had the chance to trick the Fisher King, the Fisher King might pummel him to a pulp before yeah. that because yeah. he's pretty huge. The thing is, would he know? Here's a question. Would he know that he's not going to die because his ghost isn't around? Oh, uh, well, well mm. his ghost was around in the past, though. Because right now his plan was to make the ghost a hologram, but his plan could fail and that ghost could have been uh, yeah, real. Because yeah, 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 oh, yeah, yeah, he yeah. didn't know at that point of his yeah. plan would work yet or that yeah. ghost is real. So, True. And he was True. probably a bit scared for a moment there was that that ghost wasn't going to be a hologram. <laughs> it was going to be real. And he was going to die here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, Fisher King was really cool and intimidating. Um, and he also killed some people. He killed Prentice and he killed mm -hmm. O'Donnell, which made him feel like a real threat. The only thing I wish they did a bit differently with him was that once he was actually fully revealed and was confronting the Doctor, I kind of wish that maybe he kind of thrown the Doctor around a bit and mm -hmm. maybe like hurt him a bit and stuff. Have a little, like, Batman and Bane fight. So. Yeah. I don't want to pick the Doctor <laughs> up and break it. I don't, don't want that. Yeah, it still yeah. was like, that final confrontation didn't feel... It felt very intimidating at first, but then, like, by the end, once the Doctor was like, I'm going to trick you and all that. Mm. Um, you know, by then, I, the threat was starting to dwindle because I was getting used to the Fisher King and his big size now. And mm. The fact that he wasn't really like try to hurt the doctor was starting mm. to make the tension in the scene just fade a bit towards the end. Mm. Like it was still tense. It just kinda of started to fade a bit towards the end, which I feel like to keep the tension up the whole time, the Fisher King should have kinda of like taken a few swings at the doctor mm. and like maybe even like punched him at one point or something. Yeah. To really make him feel like this big physical presence. It's like the doctor's the brain, the Fisher King is Bane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The muscle. Yeah. Um, and, and the round things have now been added in the TARDIS console room, that made me geek out, and also we got to hear the Coyster Bell a few, time, a few times, that made me geek out. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I noticed that cool. noise, even though, you know, I've only watched it, though. You've only heard it like the once yeah. before, and mm -hmm. still just was like, oh, Coyster Bell, Coyster yeah. Bell! <laughs> I was like, round things, round things! <laughs> um, Okay, so now the thing I really want to talk about. Um, one, uh, there's a slight hint to perhaps something that might be a part of the overarching storyline for the series, and that was the Minister of War, where O'Donnell's mentioning things that have kind of happened, haven't happened in uh, 1980, yeah, that's and she's been mentioning things that haven't happen happened yet. She's like, okay, Saxon hasn't happened yet, which, call back to the Master. That's that's cool. Um, moon blowing up and giant bat coming out of it. Call back to kill the moon. Yeah. Not so yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then she's like, and Minister of War hasn't happened. And then the doctor's like, oh wait, no, don't tell me. It hasn't yeah. happened yet. And I'm like, oh, Minister of War. Is that going to be like something to do with the series final this year? Yeah. Is that part of the arc the series? Or is it just one of those random lines you're not going to address again? Yeah, which we'll I hope it's part of the story. We should arc. write down these little. little well, I've written it down. Yeah, I'll but we should write down. a track of things of things that might pop up or might okay. not pop up. So far, we've got Missy teaming up with Time Lord Daleks and the Minister of War. Yeah. Okay. These yeah. these are our two things right now. Yeah. And now the thing I really really want to talk about um, with this episode is more how the episode was thematically and how it perhaps is tying into the series as a whole thematically rather than storyline wise. Yeah. Um, so far with the two stories we've had so far of the series, the theme does sort of seem to be kind of running, as in like running from your past. Mm. The Doctor, you know, in, in the opening two parter they mentioned how the Doctor's, you know, always been running all his life since he mm. left Gallifrey. And he's also and also he was running from the guilt of abandoning Davros. Mm. And this story you had a lot of um, you know, people literally running from people who had mm. died in their past because ghosts. Mm. And also you have kind of Kara becoming really intense this episode because mm. she's kind of, I get, in a way she's kind of running from Danny in a way. Yeah, Danny's, yeah. Because she, Danny's I mean like, in Last Christmas they made it sort of seem like she'd gotten over it, but in this story she doesn't seem quite so mm. over it. Like, they, 
they, they, they do kind of mention Danny in the story. They never outright say his name. The doctor's like, you should get another relationship. And, mm. you know, and then and Clara's like, doctor, you've made yourself essential to me. Mm. And it's like, you know, it's like, they're referencing Danny there. Yeah, Clara, Danny it. Clara finds the doctor essential because she needs him as emotional support to get over Danny. Mm. And, and the doctor's saying that she should maybe find another relationship because perhaps it was good for her to not just obsess about the TARDIS life because mm. it is kind of dangerous and Clara's only human. She shouldn't be running around acting like a 2,000 year old alien who can regenerate when he dies. Yeah. You know, she is mortal and has a very short lifespan mm. compared to the Doctor, yet she's starting to act like him and that is dangerous. Yeah, yeah. There was a good moment there too, um, talking about uh, her running from Danny, um, where after, oh, I've forgotten the character's name. Um, who's the girl that died? The last O'Donnell. Uh, yeah. Um, when, uh, O'Don in this episode? In the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. O'Donnell died, and at the end, the guy, the guy who was in love with her says, what do I do now? And she came up to him and said, I'm, you just keep, you just keep going. Yeah, that was, um, that was a good, that was a good bit. Yeah, yeah, that was a good little like, Yeah, there was some great, kind of incorporating the impact of Danny without ever kind of name dropping him, which felt realistic almost, because yeah. you wouldn't really mention the dead partner of your friend, would you? You would kind of, yeah. you would want to bring it up and sort of bring it up, but you couldn't yeah. quite bring yourself to like say their name, because yeah. it is kind of awkward. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then I, that lead, led on to um, that I, I moment that I wanted to talk about as well, was um, that nice part with... Um, where he then turned around and said to character's names again. Cass. Um Cass Lun. Oh, Lun, Lun, that's his name. Lun. That's his name. Said it's to Lun. Lun, um, you know, make sure you tell her you love her because, you know, it Time can be away. taken away. You know? And that was really nice. And then when he told her that was really nice. And then the fact that she like sort of at first looked like she wasn't interested, and then he like reacted off her, her body language and was like, oh, "That's what he told me to say." That was really nice. And then when they kissed, I didn't. That was really it. nice too. Oh, I found it cheesy. I liked it. I thought it was cheesy. It was. I don't. I, I don't know if it was like the I, fact that they kissed, or if it was the fact that the kiss was very intense and dramatic. Yeah, it was just dramatic. It was I like. I think it worked. Ah. Uh, Everything up to that kiss was because how could beautiful. She, and, and, but also, how could she have done it any more subtly? Because she couldn't just say, I love you too. Or she could have That's just, what would have made it or, if she said the words. They're the only words she says throughout the... I'm joking. I'm kidding. Um, that would have been cheesy. That, that would have been yeah, unbelievably that's, cheesy. That's, that was why, right, yeah. But yeah, but yeah, no, it just, it just... I don't know if it was just to do with the acting. Like, don't get me wrong. I thought the actress, her as an actress was... She, she was brilliant, she was really good, I really liked it, but just that moment, just that moment there, I went, mm, mm. I went, no. Oh, you would. Oh. What do you I, mean? I'm words? kidding, I'm kidding. Yeah, no, nah, something about it I didn't like. Nah, but okay. over. We disagree. We disagree. I'm right. But getting back, getting back to Kara, um, you know, she, she, she doesn't really seem to be of Danny's death, and she does seem to be kind of just like running from it rather than properly addressing it. Okay. She's not doing her five minutes. She's forgetting to do her five minutes. It's not healthy. It's only been five episodes, you know. It takes at least six episodes to really get out of something. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, she's, she's using sort of travelling with the Doctor as a way to kind of just to block it out of her head, mm. it seems like, rather than really properly address it, which mm. is dangerous, especially with the kind of lifestyle that the Doctor lives. Mm. Um, and she's getting reckless as well. Yeah, she's getting really reckless. And, but then, and she's getting really temperamental, mm. you know, how she starts shouting at the Doctor and she's like, you know, don't you die on me, do it with whoever comes next after me, don't you leave me. Mm. It's like, you know, she's becoming really, really desperate, I, is how it feels like. She's... Well, she's, I... No, why she, her, you know, her boyfriend's dead, her mum's dead, she, you know, she's... 
she doesn't really seem to really get along with anyone else in her family. Um, she doesn't really seem to have anyone really left now except the doctor. Mm. And it's, you know, she, there's even a scene where she says, you know, doctor, if you love me in any way, you'll find a way to fix this or something like that. And mm. when, when she says love, I don't think she means love as in, you know, girl, boy, mm. romantic, mm. sexual love. Mm. Um, I think it's more of a, you know, father, daughter kind of mm. love. Um, but yeah, but nevertheless, she does clearly love him though, in some mm. way, shape, or form, and she's the only person she's really good. The doctor's the only person she has now, and mm. it's she, she is very clearly, I think, almost starting to lose it a bit. You know, mm. she's starting to. She's got really nothing keeping her to reality now. Um, and I believe at some point she's even, um, I believe they said that at some point in the series she's going to um, quit teaching at Coal Hill School as well to travel the Doctor full time yeah. and not even go back to Earth in between, which means that she'll probably lose her grip on reality even more again because mm. then she literally is not going back to reality between adventures at, mm. by that point. She's, you know, adventure, I, adventure. I think that her end at the end of the series might be a bit... I fear that she'll forget her. She'll she's gonna forget that she's mortal, and she's gonna run into a situation, and probably get gunned down or something. Mm. Uh, mm. I'll cry when that happens. I think the doctor will probably cry too. Uh, mm. Who knows? She might not die. She might just leave. But I, I doubt it. Wait, when, when you're talking about her getting temperamental and yelling at the doctor, part of me finds that that who. I, I don't get me wrong, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying, but I think part of it also has come from the fact that she's becoming stronger as a character through her time with the Doctor, do you know what I mean? Like, and part of it, her... Time, time with the Doctor. Time with the doctor. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, uh, you want to get the yeah. joke. No, I get the joke, I get the joke. It's an episode title. Oh, is that an episode? I thought you... Okay, I got another. Alright. Um, anyway, um, part, part of me feels like that was her way of empowering the Doctor to do something different, to, to, to save himself, do you know what I mean? That wasn't really how I read it. That definitely gave the Doctor the comfort kind of boost that he needed, because yeah. he very much cares about Kara, and you know, he has that scene. And she that. knows that, and, like, and that's what I'm saying, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying, but I think it had elements of both of her saying, you, don't you, you know, don't you do this, you know, I need mm -hmm. you. Yeah, definitely, there's, there's, you know? yeah. Yeah, but Kara's like, I feel like that last series though, she'll have been a bit more caring and like she'll have been like, you know, Doctor, I, I need you, I need you to help me. Whereas now she's, she's starting to lose it a bit and now, you know, this series, mm -hmm. it's not like, Doctor, please, I need you, you know, I can't lose you. Now it's like, Doctor, I'm not losing you, you're not dying on me. But I find that screw strong, you. I find that strong. She didn't say screw, did she say screw? No, no, but the, I didn't take it like she was saying screw you, I found it like empowering, but, but, but like the, the way, the way that Jenna Coleman saw like, performed it and the way she just like presented and said it, it felt more almost threatening rather than giving a confidence boost. It more felt like she was threatening the doctor, was like, you don't die on me. I've been through enough already. Yeah. You are not dying on me. But the, and that's what, the, that's what I'm... This you is owe me. And, and she says that. She, yeah. You owe me. And that's what I... And in all fairness, he does kind of owe her. She has yeah. not saved him every time he nearly died because of that whole thing back in name of the doctor. But, you know, still she's like, she's getting really just... She, as I said, she's kind of losing it a bit. Yeah, well, I, I think it's... She's a, running uh, from, from her past in the same way the Doctor's running from her past. I, and I, I feel like running from your past is sort of the, thematically what the mm. series is sort of about. And it's not hitting us over the head with it, it's just kind of mm. there. Well, I like Series 8, which hit us over the head of its themes. And Series 7, which didn't have any themes. Mm. I, I get that she's, she is probably losing it, but that part... I felt it had a lot of strength in it too because you don't want to hear whining. I need you because that's not strong. Mm. I I need you to come back. I need you to be here. You know. You know. You know. It was. It was. This is what's no, going to no, no, happen. No, no, I, I don't mean whining. Yeah. I feel like that last series. You know, if this had happened last series, mm -hmm. I feel like that she would have not whined. I feel like that she would have kind of like, you know, done it almost like how you try and cheer a kid up rather than like yelling at the doctor. She would have kind of taken a more quieter tone mm. and tried to kind of like. Know, like comfort the doctor mm. and have that comfort 
boost his confidence. But this series is like, she don't care about his comfort. What she cares about is him still being around so mm. she can still have someone that she still cares about being in this world. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I know there's definitely elements of that. But yeah, I think yeah. It, I think it is both. It's mm. She's both trying to give the Doctor a confidence boost, but mm. also at the same time, she's kind of looking at it selfishly as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, there's there's loads more I could talk about. There's a lot of there's a lot of depth in the story, like also how the Doctor was you know, kind of quite, um, you know, you know how you know he kind of let O'Donnell die just to kind of see if his theory was correct and all mm. that. But then the fact that Clara was the next one on the list is then what you know made him then go, okay, no one else is gonna die now. Yeah. It's like someone I don't know so well. That's okay. Someone I know. Yeah, no way. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's like, then you have that confrontation between him and scientist glasses guy. Mm. You know, that scene, was, that scene was cool and it was intense and it was like, you know, it was like, you know, you just let O'Donnell die because you wanted to test your theory, but now it's coming closer to you, you're going to do something about it. Mm. And then the doctor's like, I'm not doing it because it's getting closer to me. I'm changing time to save Clara. Which, mm. that is true, mm. but it's also true that he kind of let O'Donnell die because... Mm. You know, he was like, he needed to test his theory to save everyone else, but to save everyone mm. else, he needed to test his theory of letting this one person die. Mm. And I was like, yeah, I, I like the Twelfth Doctor. This is the stuff that, I, this is the mm. stuff that makes the Twelfth Doctor cool. And gritty, yeah. And, um, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. there it is. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, conclusion time. What did you think? Overall? Mm -hmm. Eight and a half. But I'm trying to remember what I, because I think it's the best one so far, and I don't think you've seen. Yeah. That your your top score was nine and a half for Flatline. For Flatline, what one was? Oh, oh, no, it wasn't. No, no, no sorry, it wasn't as good as. Uh, it's the best one this series. Oh, this series, this series. Uh, it's only been one other one. You gave that a six. Yeah. Yeah. So eight point five. We'll go with that. Okay, an eight and a half. Eight and a half. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go with. Well, I've got yeah. I'm go, I'm gonna go over nine. Nine. I'm gonna go over nine. I know it's been ages since I've given a higher score than you, hasn't it? It has. It feels refreshing. Yeah. To be so optimistic about a story, but I really, really like this story and oh man, Toby Woodhouse. He's a great writer. Yeah. Man. Um. Yeah. Yeah. This was this was a really good one, and I'm looking forward to next week. Yeah. Yeah. Lizzie Williams from Game of Thrones. Yeah. She's amazing too. I've never seen Game of Thrones. She's so good. So? Yeah. We'll see you all next Wednesday for our review of The Girl Who Died. What an uplifting title. Mm. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Awesome.